So good evening, everyone. I'm Karen Hording, Executive Director and CEO for the Society of Women Engineers. Welcome to the WE18 Awards Banquet in Minneapolis. Tonight, SWE recognizes individuals who enhance the engineering profession through their contributions to industry, education, and the community. They have demonstrated professional excellence in their chosen STEM field, advocated for women in engineering, and contributed to the advancement of women by mentoring those around them. This year's recipients are professionals from some of the most influential corporations, universities, and research labs around the world. These men and women are leaders who help SWE empower women in STEM and work with us to close the gender gap in engineering. We are pleased to honor them with our most prestigious awards. Our theme this year is Breaking Boundaries. We chose that theme as it's a reflection of the many boundaries our members have broken in their careers and in their personal lives. And despite the progress that we have made, there are still so many boundaries yet to be broken. Thank you for joining us here in Minnesota for WE18. We hope the friendships and connections you've made continue to grow for years to come. Prior to tonight's banquet, we held the Achievement Award reception. The reception always serves as a wonderful opportunity to meet our Achievement Award and all of tonight's award recipients. Thank you to our awards reception sponsor, Global Foundries, for their continued and generous support of this event. Let's recognize them with a round of applause. At this time, I welcome Emily Riley, Senior Vice President of Human Resources with Global Foundries to say a few words. Thank you very much, Karen, and good evening to everyone. I'm very grateful to the Society of Women Engineers for the honor of speaking to this amazing group tonight. Congratulations to this year's nominees, award recipients, and to all of you who are breaking boundaries. I'm the Chief Human Resources Officer for Global Foundries and co-founder of our organization, Global Women, and I'm an engineer. Global Foundries is a semiconductor manufacturer with a truly global footprint. We are a team of 17,000 technical professionals and leaders. Earlier this year, we created our new vision, changing the industry that is changing the world. And tonight, I am so proud to have 25 of my colleagues joining me. They are women changing the industry that is changing the world. As I was reflecting on this year's conference theme, I was considering the thoughts that I wanted to share with you tonight. My first reaction was one of energy and boldness. Let's take charge, let's break boundaries. Yeah, we got this. What a powerful theme. Then I settled in to consider what breaking boundaries has meant for me in my life and how I have seen so many talented and successful women do the same in countless large and small ways. The boundaries we face and the perception of what boundaries exist evolve over the years, but also enlighten us and surprise us each and every day. Tonight, I'm going to share with you a few steps on my personal journey. I grew up in a very small town, and my mom and dad were math and physics teachers in my own school system. I came from an academic family, and loving math and science decided that engineering was for me. It was 1981, and I was planning to apply to Cornell's engineering school. I went to my high school guidance counselor to seek help with the application process and with my essay. When I met with him, he told me I would never get accepted into Cornell and said that I should apply to other schools that he had in mind for me. I left his office. I was surprised, dismayed, and puzzled as to why he wouldn't help me with my first big life dream. Wasn't this his job? It was strange to hear something so negative. 
When I got home from school, I shared with my mom what he had said, and she instantly replied, well, then we'll just have to go do this ourselves. With her positivity, this boundary completely dissolved in front of my eyes and never got in my way. I was accepted into Cornell early decision and was the only student from my class of 82 to attend an Ivy League school. Fast forward, fast forward almost 40 years to this past spring, I was so proud to learn that the Cornell undergrad engineering program has broken the boundary of gender parity with the class of 2021 being 51% female. Go Big Red! Some years later, working for General Electric as an engineer in their Six Sigma days, I was placed into a black belt position. Those were the jobs at the time, and to really move forward in the company, you had to be successful in a Six Sigma role as either a black belt or a master black belt. Six months into my role, I was really struggling with the concepts, lagging behind my colleagues, and feeling very intimidated and scared in my job. I was fearful that I would not become successful, and I was convinced that I was at the boundary of my own technical competence. After several months of feeling very insecure in my capability and my project being delayed and criticized, I got up my nerve to ask for help. I contacted a brilliant and giving colleague at GE's Global Research Center, Martha Gardner, who mentored me through the largest project of my career to date. She was wonderful to me, and I learned the importance of asking for help, being resourceful, and building a network. I was able to expand the boundaries of my work and my potential just by opening up and asking for help. Once this fear was removed, I have enjoyed so many incredible new projects and roles since then. With this life lesson, I learned that I would have boundaries around me if I didn't share, connect, collaborate, and reach out to others. Six months ago, I became the Chief Human Resources Officer for my company. It is the opportunity of a lifetime, and I instantly became energized and empowered to fix all those things I had been complaining about forever. I was now able to do all those things that I wanted to do for our company and for our people. No more boundaries, I can do what I want now. Well, I have been on an incredible learning curve in these past six months, and I still am. As I meet with teams, individuals, executives, board members, and organizations outside of our company, I'm learning that the path forward may not be what I think is good for the company or the team, but if I'm not listening and open to the creations of others, then I may become the person who is placing boundaries around an amazing and special group of people who are truly changing the world. As you see boundaries, own them understand them, and be the courageous women that you are. Dealing with boundaries and facing challenges creates who we are and who we will become. When I think of the boundaries in my life, both real and perceived, I wonder what may have happened if that boundary, fear, or obstacle had not been in front of me. Would I have risen to the occasion? Would I have helped someone else? Would I have had the courage to knock down another boundary without this practice? So in closing, be bold, melt boundaries away, look beyond the boundaries, work around the boundaries, or ignore them altogether. Reshape and mold boundaries to fit what you want and what you need. Move boundaries, explain, expand boundaries, and question boundaries. But most of all, embrace that the boundaries we face are there for a reason. We need them to shape who we are and to bring out the best we can be to build our confidence, our self-worth, to grow our careers, to lead our teams, to take care of families and loved ones, and to inspire other women and the world. Thank you very much, and celebrate yourselves on this most wonderful evening. Thank you. I've become pretty comfortable breaking boundaries. <laughs> Thank you. I've had so many wonderful opportunities beca uh, because I didn't accept the boundaries that had been set by others. I believe that in order to allow individuals to do great things and create a better world together, 
certain boundaries must be broken. And I'm so excited to recognize the award recipients here tonight who have broken boundaries in a myriad of ways. Since 1952, SWE has recognized 997 award recipients at its annual conference awards banquets. And I would like to invite all of the previous SWE award recipients to stand. There are some really incredible women in this room. Recognizing the accomplishments of women in engineering is a critical part of our mission. And it's possible, it's made possible with our two award banquet sponsors, Northrop Grumman and Boston Scientific. Without their support, uh, tonight would not be possible. So I would uh, like to welcome Ruth Bishop, Vice President of Global Mission and Excellence Technology from Northrop Grubbin to make a few remarks. Good evening and welcome to this wonderful event where we recognize women who are making a significant impact on our industry. I resonate with this year's conference theme of let's break boundaries. <laughs> Having been in this field for more than 30 years, it's amazing to see the progress women are making in technology. While we're continuing to make progress, we still have opportunities to continue to break through, but we can't do it on our own. We need to support one another, lift up each other, and have each other's back. I'm proud of the work our team is doing at Northrop Grumman to, <laughs> to continue to not only support women in breaking boundaries, but to encourage by providing employee resources and opportunities to build strong global network of women. I'm proud to say Northrop Grumman's Women's International Network team is being recognized this evening with the Silver Award for Professional ERGs and the Best Practice for Global Category for Professional ERGs. Our women's ERG group is only one of the opportunities our women have for support. Earlier this year, we partnered with those across the globe to celebrate International Women's Day with activities that recognize the achievements of women throughout our company, our industry, and our world. Our company also sponsors a women in leadership cohort. This initiative brings together women from across the company to provide leadership development and executive resources to recognize up and coming talent in our company. We recognize the women also may face different challenges in different parts of their career. In partnership with SWE and iRelaunch, we launched iReturn, a 12-week returnship program that prepares candidates who have taken a career break for a year or two from their full-time career. I'm pleased to say we have extended offers to many of these candidates for full-time employment with Northrop Grumman. Northrop Grumman fosters leaders who are blazing a trail for the next generation of SWE members. An example of one of our trailblazers is Suzanne Genesis. Su Suzanne is a former vice president and general manager at Northrop Grumman and a SWE pioneer. We are proud to award Suzanne Genesis Upward Mobility Award this evening to a deserving woman. 
an award which celebrates an individual's rise to success and contributions to decision-making process throughout their organization. Also, earlier this year, Northrop Grumman was recognized with the Catalyst Award for our global initiatives accelerating progress for women in the workplace. It is a true privilege to go into the office every day, working alongside colleagues and a company leadership who support and empower women, embrace and promote diversity, and champion the value of inclusion in the workplace. As I look around the room, I'm encouraged that the future of our forthcoming generation of women engineers in the workplace is bright. Through the efforts of the company, like Northrop Grumman, fellow sponsors, and organizations like SWE, I'm excited to see the continued progress we will achieve together. Remember, we need to support one another, mentor, and teach the next generation of engineers. Look out for each other and have each other's back. Together, we can lift up each other. Together, we can fight gender bias. Together, we can create workplace equality. Together, we can create opportunities for future innovators. I'm humbled to be here with you and look forward to tonight's celebration and recognizing many of you for your amazing accomplishments. Again, we can't do this on our own. Let's break boundaries together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we will now hear remarks from Boston Scientific's Julie Thompson, Director of Research and Development Diagnostics and Therapy Innovation with the Cardiac Rhythm Management. Well, it's really an honor to be here with you all this evening. And on behalf of Boston Scientific, we're proud to be a sponsor of this year's conference and gala. Boston Scientific is a $9 billion global company dedicated to transforming lives with innovative medical solutions that improve the healthcare of people around the world. And we deliver a range of different technology solutions that impact many different health situations, and we impact the lives of over 40 million people every year. So one of the things that I really value about working for a company like Boston Scientific is the fact that we really do have a genuine opportunity to directly impact people's lives. And I can say that through the course of my career, technology that I have personally worked on is now being utilized by thousands of people across the world to improve the quality of their care. But in addition to the fact that we do really rewarding work, I also appreciate the fact that we have an incredibly supportive internal culture at Boston Scientific. And some of our key values include things like innovation, collaboration, caring, and diversity. And I can say from experience that those are values I see practiced on a daily basis in our work culture. But speaking of diversity, when I joined this organization almost 18 years ago, I was the fifth female employee to ever work in the research department at this company. And that, at that time, there were probably about 60 engineers and scientists in that department. So I'm very happy to say that over the last 18 years, we've made a lot of progress in improving and changing the diversity profile of our organization. But we're not done with that journey yet. And diversity has been a high priority in this organization, really from the top down. Um, and the reason for that is we genuinely believe that successful organizations are made up of diverse teams and that diversity is really key for innovation. So it's the right thing to do for people and it makes good business sense. And so for that reason, we've set very specific diversity goals as an organization and we're holding ourselves publicly accountable towards those goals by publishing them as well as our progress towards them um, on our Boston Scientific Diversity and Inclusion website that any of you can, can visit. So that brings me back to why we're here today. 
Over the past couple of days, our team of 32 employees have had a chance to talk to almost 900 of you. And it was important for us to be here this week because one, we wanted to make sure we get a chance to meet the many talented women in this organization and wanted to give us a chance to fill some of our open positions with women like you. I'm happy to say that of the 900 of you that we've spoken to, we had a chance to interview 55 of you and we've already made 16 offers just in the last couple of days, which is really fantastic. So on behalf of Boston Scientific, I just want to thank all of you for your engagement in this organization. I want to congratulate all of you that are going to be honored this evening. Um, you really are an inspiration to us all. And I want to encourage and challenge all of us to continue breaking boundaries and be that engineer. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, to Go Global Foundries, Northrop Grumman Corporation, and Boston Scientific for your support of SWE and of this event. Thank you so much. Now it's time to issue some awards. So, <laughs> yay! so let's uh, welcome SWE's FY19 President-elect, Cindy Hoover to the stage to help me bestow our first set of awards. <laughs> All right, well before we begin recognizing tonight's award recipients, I want to recognize the volunteers who made this evening possible. Members of the SWE Awards and Recognition Committee we're challenged with the selection of our recipients from a wide array of distinguished nominees, and the committee was led by two of our very own leaders. Will Fiscal Year 19 Chair and Chair-elect Allison Bergman and Ashley Copeland please stand? <laughs> Ashley. Ashley and Allison, thank you for your dedication and leadership to the Awards and Recognition Committee, where you were each did an, a substantial amount of work to celebrate tonight's awardees. Now, would all A&R committee members please stand with Ashley and Allison and be recognized for your contributions. Thank you for your thoughtful consideration identifying the 2018 award recipri recipients. We appreciate your very hard work. And Allison, don't sit down quite yet. I now invite you to the podium to recognize our first set of awards. Tonight, we will start by recognizing our youngest award recipients and the future of women in engineering. The SWE Next Global Innovator Awards are given to SWE Nexters who have been actively engaged in the SWE community, have a solid understanding of engineering principles, play a role in serving their own community, and demonstrate strong leadership skills. It is now my honor to recognize the 2018 SWE Next Global Innovator Award recipients as Svati Partiba, <laughs> Jathi Ramaswamy, <laughs> Unushka Saroon, Kate Stack and Sunjana Shah, who is unable to be with us this evening.
congratulations again to all our SWE Next awardees. Let's welcome back Cindy Hoover to the stage to continue with our next awards. I am now honored to present our next award of the evening, this year's Rodney D. Chip Memorial Award. This award recognizes a man or company that has contributed significantly to the acceptance and advancement of women in the engineering field. Rodney D. Chip was a prominent engineer who demonstrated significant support and enthusiasm for the Society of Women Engineers. The spouse of SWE's first president, Beatrice Hicks, he was the first of many men who championed SWE and women in engineering. The first of our three Rodney D. Chip Memorial Award recipients this evening is Dr. Thomas A. Kennedy of the Raytheon Company. Dr. Kennedy is being honored for his career-long support of women engineers and for leveraging top-level executive authority to champion diversity and inclusion in the workplace and in STEM as a whole. Thank you for the kind words. Uh, I do want to also thank you and the SWE Award and Recognition Committee for this outstanding honor tonight. I'm honored to accept this award on behalf of the thousands, the thousands of women engineers at Raytheon Corporation. And also for four special women, my wife, my wonderful wife, Elaine, where she's at here in the crowd. And my fabulous three daughters, Kyleen, Kelly, and Carlin. So Kelly is here tonight, and is actually an electrical engineer herself, and also was a past president of SWE for UMass Amherst. I'm very proud that uh, she's chosen the engineering profession. And uh, someday I, I look to be out in the audience and uh, have her out here receiving an award. So no pressure, Kelly. <laughs> and it wasn't lost on me when uh, Kelly graduated in her electrical engineering class and the fact that uh, she, there was, she was a 10 percenter. Only 10 percent of the class, less than 10 percent of the class, electrical engineering class, were females. And I reflected back when I graduated, it was zero. I had, we had zero women in my electrical engineering class, and zero in the class before me, and zero in the class after me. And uh, the thing that really hit me is how long it's taken from that period. And I was, I was I'm ancient, so I, was, I graduated a long time ago. How long it took to get to 10 percent? And I, I can tell you, we must, uh, we must do more. I have tried to do my share, and uh, that's from the start of my career back in the 80s, and now especially as a leader in the aerospace industry, to try to make women a priority in engineering. I've always asked you know, do, in the company, do we have the right talent? Do we have the right diverse talent set? Because without talent, and without a diverse talent, you really can't be competitive in the marketplace. And I am a very deep believer in diversity and inclusion, especially in terms of diversity of thought, diversity of culture, and having multifunction teams, diverse teams. And I will tell you, in running a company, a major company, 64,000 employees, diversity is not something just nice to do. Diversity is a business, a business imperative. And we need leaders of our company to also be diverse. And in an engineering term, you have to be able to impedance match with the world as a company. And you can't impedance match if you don't have a diverse workforce and a diverse engineering workforce. <laughs> you 
Now, we have many great women engineers. I said thousands of engineers. Uh, we are driving to have tens of thousands of engineers, women engineers. And tonight here, we have uh, great women at the engineering company at Raytheon, leaders in their fields from cyber and hypersonics to nanotechnology, additive manufacturing. And tonight, we have including several SWE fellows and SWE distinguished new engineers here tonight in attendance. So, Raytheon. I have a several commitments. One commitment is to these women engineers, but also to all the women at Raytheon to ensure the company provides an environment where they want to join, they want to stay and grow their careers. So coming back to this 10% that I talked about, 10% of Kelly's class being women, only women, we realize that to improve those numbers, we need to do something different. And we have to engage girls at a much younger age than the waiting to college. And so that's why we have made a commitment to the Girl Scouts. So in addition to the traditional work that the Girl Scouts do, they are now working with girls in terms of a national computer science program and getting them interested in science and technology in the middle schools and in high schools, where a large percentage of women tend to drop out of the STEM area. So the bottom line, Raytheon is a company where women engineers can thrive. They can bring their creative energies to our customers' hardest problems, and they have satisfying, rewarding careers. So if you're looking for your next job, <laughs> if you are looking for your next great job, we encourage you to join the Raytheon team. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kennedy, for all of your contributions to advancing women in engineering. Tonight's second Rodney D. Chip Memorial Award recipient is the Naval Surface Warfare Center Corona Division. I now invite Ms. Diane Coslow, Technical Director with the Naval Surface Warfare Center, to the stage. On behalf of the Society of Women Engineers, I present the Naval Surface Warfare Center Corona Division with this award for outstanding commitment to recruiting and advancing women engineers, for ensuring the upward mobility of women across its ranks, and for consistent outreach and recruitment aimed at building a vibrant STEM workforce. On behalf of Naval Surface Warfare Center Corona Division, I want to thank the Society of Women Engineers for this incredible honor. For over 50 years, Corona Division has been a leader in the U.S. Navy's research, development, test, and evaluation process with our mission to gauge the warfighting capability of the Navy. We employ 1,600 government employees and another 1,800 support contractors assessing Navy surface warfare readiness and capability, engineering and operating the fleet's live virtual constructive training architecture, and serving as the Navy and, metrology, and Marine Corps' metrology and calibration engineering agent, ensuring the accuracy of precision combat systems. Corona Division is a leader in data analytics and focusing on turning data into information and making it transparent to decision makers and the warfighter. I've had the pleasure to work for Corona Division, located in Southern California, for over 33 years. And during that time, I've been able to witness our organizational change firsthand, embracing diversity and inclusion, and making a commitment to the advancement of women engineers and scientists. When I began my career, there were very few women engineers. Realizing a change was needed, 
leadership placed a focus on assuring equal consideration for all in policies and practices. It took over 15 years to develop a sufficient succession pool, resulting in the first woman division head being selected in 1999, and in 2004, the first woman department head was finally selected. And last year, I was named the first senior executive service technical director at Corona Division. At every step, the perceived boundaries were broken, and other women followed closely behind in my steps. 17% of Corona Division scientists and engineers are women, as compared to the 13% national average for engineering. And we have an equal percentage of women in the science and engineering supervisory and leadership ranks, with equivalent pay at all levels within the organization. Corona's Corona's recruitment and promotion strategies have resulted in a growing trend toward closing the gender gap. But that doesn't happen by accident. With our local community, over the past 15 years, we have been working and priming the STEM pump, supporting the annual Science and Technology edu Educational Partnership event that attracts over 5,000 students from fourth grade through high school to learn about STEM careers. The exit surveys taken from STEP show that 51% of the attendees are girls and that attendees are favorably inclined to explore a STEM education and career. Our educational partnerships with the local K-12 school district and the Colleges of Engineering at the UC Riverside, Cal Baptist University, CSU Los Angeles, Cal Poly Pomona have opened the doors to getting the best and the brightest. National recruiting events like SWE 18 provide even more focused recruiting for diverse applicants. In addition, flexible work schedules, career development opportunities, innovative work environment, and our key guiding principle to assure work-life balance are key contributors to our success. Corona Division is proud to be one of four Navy Warfare Center laboratories supporting surface, undersea, air and space, with locations spread across the country. Diversity and inclusiveness is a business imperative in all of our Navy activities. Last November, Undersea and Surface Warfare Center divisions held the leadership in a diverse environment training conference, which focused on the challenges and opportunities facing women in leadership, and encouraged and empowered women to pursue leadership ambitions. We brought together executive leaders across our enterprise to tell their stories and provide guidance for the women coming behind them, centered around three important points. Number one, be competent in your field of study, gaining experience and expertise to be the best you can be. Number two, be confident in yourself and your abilities. And number three, be courageous to step up take a seat at the table, and have your voice heard. Competence, confidence, and courage, important lessons for all of us. Thank you again for this wonderful honor, and we look forward to having SWE 19 in our backyard in Anaheim, California. Tonight's final Rodney D. Chip Memorial Award recipient is Paul Sowerby of Cummins Incorporated. As our final recipient, Mr. Sowerby is being recognized with this award for encouragement, support, and advocacy of women engineers and for groundbreaking achievements in gender balance driven by a core belief in diversity and inclusion. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Uh, thank you for this award. I'm deeply humbled and honored that you chose Cummins, not just Paul Sowerby, to receive this award. There is, thank you, there is an amazing team working in the background, the technical women leaders team, that goes all out to further the cause in Cummins and actually in the broader SWE organization. That, to me, speaks much, much better than me telling you about Cummins and our diversity around the globe. My name is Paul Sowerby. I am a 60-year-old, privileged, white male <laughs> who tries very, very hard every day to be a really good ally, a good advocate, and to further the cause of gender diversity in everything that we do. You might ask, why does he think it's so hard? <laughs> what do you think, yeah? Yeah? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the comedy turn. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's hard because I believe you're either an ally, an advocate, or a diversity champion, or you're not, and there's no middle ground. Those folks are the real pretenders. I also believe that actions speak much louder than words. So you might ask yourself, especially the gentlemen in the room, what have I done today to demonstrate my allyship, my advocacy, or simply to further the cause for gender equality? You might be surprised at the answer, and I encourage you all to reflect upon whatever that answer is, and then to take action, because action speaks louder than words. You might also ask yourself, why do I think I'm so privileged? I'm privileged because I've been blessed with a lifelong career at Cummins, a loving family, all female by the way, which is the absolute bonus. <laughs> and I've had the honor to work on every continent in the world, except Antarctica, with some really talented people and some really strong female leaders. And that is, when you're towards the end of your career, a very, very fulfilling and rewarding situation to be in. When I reflect on the evolution of Cummins over the last 44 years, however, I do have to question whether that would have been the case if I was a woman. Fortunately, today I'm absolutely sure that the answer would be yes, and I'm very, very proud to work for a company that promotes diversity and inclusion in individuals from all walks of life, irrespective of origin or gender. I'm absolutely overwhelmed to work for one of our best women CTO in the industry, Jennifer Rumsey, who is sat over here. I've seen Jennifer grow through her career, and it is one of my proudest moments when she took over as CTO from our previous diversity champion, Dr. John Wall. Thank you, Jennifer. The Cummins environment 
is one that has encouraged me to leverage my passion for diversity and inclusion over the last 15 years and enabled me to really make a difference, especially in cultures around the world where the challenges are immense. You may think I'm talking about China or India, but to be honest, the challenges are no different even here in the US. Despite the progress that we've made to date, as evidenced by the room tonight, we still have a very long way to go. A very long way to go, believe me. So in, in closing, I am proud to be part of this revolution and I'm excited to be associated with the Society of Women Engineers and their global efforts in this field. Thank you everyone. Keep the face, keep the faith, sorry. And <laughs> you can keep the face as well if you want, I don't mind. Yeah. Let's just change the world forever because there are no boundaries. There are no boundaries whatsoever. Thank you. Congratulations again to our Rodney D. Chip Memorial Award recipients, and thank you for your commitment and genuine support of women in engineering. Okay, our next award, the Swede Distinguished New Engineer Award, or DNE. This award honors women who have demonstrated outstanding technical performance, as well as leadership in professional organizations and the community in the first 10 years of their career. This year, we have 10 recipients for the Swede DNE Award. Recipients, as your name is read, please step up to the stage to receive your award from Penny and be ready to pose for a quick photo. After you receive your award, if you could exit the stage, but please stand in a line, um, we will uh, continue to recognize you as a group uh, prior to returning to your seats. All right, our first Swede Distinguished New Engineer Award of the evening is presented to Latia Blanco. She is with Raytheon Company. This award is for outstanding work in systems engineering, for excellent team leadership, and for extraordinary initiative in creating the Design Your World STEM programming series, impacting more than 1,800 girls. Our second, our second SWE Distinguished New Engineer Award of the evening is presented to Dr. Caitlin J. Bunker with Rocky Mountain Institute. For contributing valuable research in renewable energy solutions in the Caribbean and to underserved communities, and for steadfast leadership at all levels of the Society of Women Engineers.
Next, we honor award recipient Stephanie Beji to the stage with Ambitech, a Zachary Group company for significant cross-disciplinary workplace contributions in computer engineering, for wholehearted community service, and for inspiring and effective leadership at all levels of the society. to Latia Blanco with Raytheon. Sorry. Sorry, this is really messed up. The next, huh? I'm trying, it's not good. Yeah, I am trying. It's, uh, yeah, we're missing. The next individual to receive her award is Paola Shavira with Soul Cal Gas. <laughs> Receiving her award for technical accomplishments in support of energy efficiency for stellar community service and for making inclusive technical outreach the keynote of her SWE leadership. We honor, our, we honor our next reward recipient. Did we do Stephanie Feige? Thank you. Is, the next award recipient for DNE Award is Natalie Miller with James G. Davis Construction Corporation for setting a high bar for success in architectural engineering, for longstanding service to SWE, and for commitment to educating and inspiring current and, current and future women engineers. Amy Jo Moore with Northrop Grumman Corporation for dedication <laughs> for dedication to the future of engineering through technical leadership in the workplace, for commitment to SWE's mission, and for working to increase female representation in the profession. We honor our next DNE Award recipient, who is unfortunately able to be with us this evening, Rupali Patil with John Deere for wide-ranging technical expertise coupled with a strong desire to create positive social change and for extraordinary service to SWE, especially in international initiatives. Adriana Porter with Black & Veatch Corporation for being a trusted leader with proven technical and organizational skills for encouraging students, especially young women, to enter STEM professions and for long-term dedication to SWE. Receiving her DNE, DNE Award for making a mark in civil engineering, ensuring safe stormwater management, and for earnest engagement in community service, and for directing boundless energy towards SWE's mission, we recognize Kathleen Saunders with Quibble and Associates PC. Our final Distinguished New Engineer Award of the Night goes to Cassandra Zuck of Naval Service Warfare Center, Philadelphia Division. For exemplary resourcefulness in critical U.S. Navy computer engineering assignments, for dedication to the well-being of our community, and for long-term commitment to SWE's collegiate section.
Congratulations to all of our 2018 SWE Distinguished New Engineer Award recipients. I'll try to do a better job on this award. Um, with our next award, we will be recognizing 10 deserving recipients with the Emerging Leader Award. The, Emer the Emerging Leader Award looks to honor women engineers with 10 to 15 years of professional experience and uh, who demonstrate outstanding technical excellence in their field. Award recipients, again, after you receive your award, please exit the stage and stand in line. You will be recognized as a group and a photo will be taken before returning to your seats. The first Emerging Leader Award is presented to Lynn Davenport with Medtronic. <laughs> Lynn is receiving her award for outstanding contributions to life-changing medical devices, demonstrating leadership and technical expertise and for increasing the visibility of women engineers at Medtronic and throughout her community. For deep technical expertise and leadership in a wide variety of technologies, leading to successful applica applications for passionate advocacy of women engineers and for encouraging students to pursue STEM careers. Our next ELA recipient is Dr. Rebecca Beist with the Dow Chemical Company. Next, receiving her award for defining leadership through adaptability and tenacity, demonstrating courage and intellectual curiosity, and for excelling in successive roles while encouraging others, and for enthusiastic outreach and volunteer services is Dana Johnson with GE Power. recipient is Anna Paula Ribeiro Moroto of Cummins Incorporated for demonstrating technical prowess and collaborative skills, for raising the bar for herself with each challenge, and for dedication to ensuring an inclusive environment for all. recipient is Maureen Sulis with Ball Aerospace for strong technical and leadership acumen, for dedication and commitment to all levels of SWE, and for deeply engaged service to youth and the community. Next to receive her award is Angel McMullen Gunn with United Technologies Aerospace Systems. Angel receives her award for exemplary technical ability that influences aerospace manufacturing quality as a whole and her unswerving commitment to her community and to SWE through strong advocacy of STEM.
Our next ELA recipient is Anna Luisa Mendoza with Northrop Grumman Corporation. For technical excellence, for mindfulness of others as a leader and team player, and for barrier-breaking support of diversity and inclusion among her colleagues and in her community. Our next ELA recipient is Eileen Velez Vega of Kimley Horn, Puerto Rico, LLC. Who receives, who receives her award for expert cross-functional leadership that ensures the safe and effective operations of airport design and construction and for demonstrating a true survivor's compassion and courage in supporting others. Dr. Alexis Wasserman with Merck for significant contributions that have positively impacted human health, for commitment to developing young people, and for career-long passionate support of diversity and inclusion. recipient of the evening is Teresa Wesley with Booz Allen Hamilton. <laughs> Teresa is receiving her ELA award for multidisciplinary leadership for taking one career leap after another to achieve long-term goals and for encouraging others to achieve at the highest level through thoughtful mentoring. Once again, congratulations to all 10 2018 Emerging Leader Award recipients. Now, please join me in welcoming John Agurkin, Swee's immediate past president, to the stage to assist with the next set of awards. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, thank you. You should be used to this already. So our next group of honorees, I am actually very thrilled to induct our 2018 SWE Class of Fellows. <laughs> Fellows are SWE members with at least 20 years of membership who are awarded the honor in recognition of the continuous service to the advancement of women in the engineering profession. Fellow is SWE's highest grade of membership. Fellows, after you receive your pin, please remain on the stage so we can recognize you as a group and take a photo before returning to your seats. Our first SWE Fellow tonight Receive this, this honor for exceptional commitment to shaping public policy and its role in K-12 STEM education and for expanding outreach at every, and participation at every step of her SWE career. Let's welcome Elizabeth Bierman with Comcast to the stage. <laughs> Our 
next SWE Fellow to receive this honor is Pamela Dingman with Lancaster County, Nebraska for trailblazing entrepreneurship, for our ongoing contributions to the vitality of SWE, and for raising the visibility of women engineers in private practice and as civil servants. Next, for exhibiting exemplary, exemplary leadership and inclusiveness in the workplace and beyond, and for consistent contributions to process improvement and advocacy at all levels throughout SWE, please recognize our next fellow, Cindy Hoover with Spirit Arrow Systems. I'm sorry, I have to get kissed. Our next SWE Fellow is recognized for a sterling record of professional achievement, for expanding the scope and reach of SWE, especially through scholarship promotion and for decades of leadership and outreach. Please congratulate Gina Janke with Modi Manufacturing Company. Our next SWE Fellow receives this honor for decades of inspired service as role model, mentor to me, and a leader in the workplace, SWE, and the community, and for serving all three with dedication and enthusiasm. Please help me congratulate Andrea Carolus with Pratt & Whitney. Next, for steadily raising the standards for what women engineers can achieve, and for exceptional service to SWE that maintains mentorship and advocacy at its core, we recognize our next SWE Fellow, Dr. Mary Royable with Raytheon Missile Systems. fellow to be recognized with this honor is Elise R. Stouffer with Medtronic for exemplary technical and collaborative skills as a global leader and for building enthusiasm and participation through mentoring and leadership at every level of SWE.
I extend my sincerest congratulations to the 2018 Class of SWE Fellows. It is an honor to acknowledge your significant contributions and engineering achievements. Thank you for your dedication and ongoing commitment to SWE and our mission. <laughs> Our next award tonight is SWE's Distinguished Engineering Educator Award. The Distinguished Engineering Educator is presented to a female engineering educator who has demonstrated excellence in teaching and research and who has made significant contributions to the engineering profession. This year, I am thrilled to announce the 2018 Distinguished Engineering Educator Award goes to Dr. Elizabeth Shaw Wexler of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign for a steadfast commitment to student success and project-based, team-based learning, for leadership in revamping engineering curricula, and for serving as an encouraging role model and mentor. Unfortunately, Elizabeth is unable to be with us this evening, so let's give her a nice, sweet round of applause for this honor. Now, we'll work on the SWE's PRISM Awards. The SWE PRISM Award was created to recognize women who have charted their own path in the STEM fields by demonstrating a variety of outstanding career leadership activities in a technical field, as well as leadership in professional organizations and the STEM community. We are very excited to honor five true leaders in STEM fields. Please help me welcome to the stage our first PRISM Award winner, of, excuse me, recipient of the evening, Chris Acosta of Northrop Grumman Corporation. She receives her award for sustained and inspiring mentoring of the next generation of women engineers for lasting contributions to a professional community and leadership in aerospace programs. Our next PRISM Award recipient of the night is Vicki Dawkins of Emerson Hermetic Motor. She receives her award for meeting challenges with openness to diverse cultures and ideas, for business and technical expertise that drives improvements in the community, and for inspiring women and girls in STEM. Our third PRISM recipient of the evening is Dr. Dina Disraeli of the Institute for Defense Analysis. Dina receives her award for remarkable accomplishments in strategic defense and national security and for developing creative ways to teach and encourage women and minorities to pursue careers in STEM. Our next PRISM Award recipient is Anka Isley with John Deere. Anka receives her award for top-level organizational and technical abilities, for mastering new languages and cultures, and thriving in an international business environment, and for tireless advocacy of SWE's global presence. Our final
final PRISM Award recipient of the night is Dr. Katie Thorpe of the Air Force Resource Research Laboratory. Katie is recognized for her significant advances in research and engineering of novel aerospace materials, and who, while she was with us, contributed to career-long commitment to empowering women and minorities in technical fields through advocacy and mentoring. Tonight, to receive this honor, this award in her honor and her memory, are her mother, Mary Kay Britton, and husband, John Thorpe. Congratulations again to all of our 2018 PRISM Award recipients. Our next award this evening, our next award is the Spark Award. Ooh, we still have some spark in the room, great. The Spark Award was created to honor those who have contributed to the advancement of women by mentoring those around them. These individuals have made a difference in the lives of many by affecting women at a variety of levels, ranging from high school to the more senior levels in relation to their position. I would like to invite tonight's recipients to the stage when their name is called. Receiving tonight's first Spark Award for using her unique and unrepeatable voice to promote diversity and mentorship and for providing the tools infrastructure and inspiration for women to achieve their goals is Vicki Mueller Espinosa of Intel Corporation. across all levels of SWE as a champion for change and pushing herself and others to new heights through thoughtful teaching and guidance. Our next Spark Award recipient is Carrie Greenfelder of Burns and McDonald. in reliability engineering and for nuanced membership that mentorship that provides steady guidance helping women engineers gain skill perspective and a sense of community Dr. Ann McLaren with Cummins Incorporated
leveraging superb communication skills to influence countless women and girls, and for channeling experiences as a wife, mother, and engineer into supporting others in their development. Our next Spark Award recipient this evening is Gina Vitale of General Motors. Our fifth and final Spark Award goes to Shenhui Wu of Northrop Grumman Corporation. She receives her award for a distinguished technical career, for inspiring and inclusive leadership, and for a generous spirit that supports others, from women engineers to cancer research and care for the homeless. Congratulations again to our 2018 Spark Award recipients. You truly are sparks of inspiration for women engineers. Our next award, the Global Leadership Award, honors a person who works in and leads in internationally based engineering, scientific, or technology focused business or organization. And in doing so, serves as a role model to women engineers and technologists worldwide. Now join me as we recognize and celebrate these global leaders. Please welcome our first Global Leadership Award recipient, Gail Heck Sweeney of Keysight Technologies, for demonstrating immense skill at managing diverse organizations, for transforming multinational teams into a cohesive whole that delivers results and for consistently fostering innovation through diversity. Tonight's second GLA award goes to Mariana Karam of John Deere for an exceptionally diverse career, for sharing an extraordinary scope of knowledge and experience with others, and for embodying service for both country and community. Unfortunately, our final Global Leadership Award recipient is unable to join us this evening. However, we would like to recognize Kimberly Patel with Ford Motor Company for, for exemplary stewardship of quality, safety, and sustainability standards in the automotive industry, for promoting diversity and inclusion, and for unfailing generosity in spirit of mentoring others. Congratulations again to the 2018 Global Leadership Award recipients. May your achievements inspire future award recipients around the world. And in keeping with the global theme, we're going to move to our next award, which was first awarded last year, the Global Team Leadership Award. This award is presented to a team with a woman in technical leadership role that meet or exceed project objectives while demonstrating innovative thinking to overcome global challenges. Tonight, we recognize the 2018 recipient of the Global Team Leadership Award, 
John Deere Tractor Embedded Architecture System Engineering and Quality Team, led by Reka Gore. The John Deere team receives tonight's award for development collaboration on a global scale for pioneering a foundation for next generation electronic systems and for standout results achieved in an atmosphere of mutual trust, respect, and accountability. set of awards, Advocating Women in Engineering, AWE. This award honors individuals who have demonstrated professional excellence in their chosen STEM field and proven to be advocates of women in engineering and SWE's goals. A maximum of five awards are presented annually. This year, we are excited to acknowledge five exemplary women, and we welcome them as Advocating Women in Engineering Award recipients. Receiving her award for a stellar career of technical and managerial accomplishments and for tireless and ingenious use of media to speak out for SWE and for gender diversity in engineering, please welcome Stacy Del Vecchio of Caterpillar. <laughs> Our second recipient of the evening receives her award for championing the technical abilities of community college students and for launching a dazzling array of imaginative and practical engineering education programs for women and minorities. Please help me congratulate Dr. Rose Margaret Ekengatua with Olon College. recipient tonight receives her award for a long and successful career in power engineering and for her advocacy of women and girls in STEM that is deep, consistent, and authentic. Please welcome to the stage Dr. Mary Isaac of Hedge Company. fundamental and applied research in chemistry and aeronautics, for outstanding technical leadership, and for advocacy of women in the STEM careers of the future. Please welcome to the next award, excuse me, goes to Dr. Qin Yao Nguyen of NASA. <laughs> A 
Our final recipient is honored for accomplishments as a technical expert, business leader, and strategic partner, and for helping others succeed by promoting the engineering profession and advocating for women and minorities in STEM. Please welcome Kristen Robertson with the Boeing Company. Congratulations to all our Advocating Women in Engineering Award recipients. You truly have reached out to support your fellow women engineers and have set the bar pretty high for future award recipients. I now welcome back Penny to the stage to recognize the final two awards of the evening. Okay. Well, that was fun. <laughs> At this time, I would like to invite Ruth Bishop of Northrop Grumman back to the stage to present our next award, the Suzanne Genesis Upward Mobility Award. This award was endowed by Northrop Grumman to honor SWE past president, SWE fellow, and SWE achievement award recipient, and my friend, Suzanne Genesis. Suzanne had the vision to create this award in 1986, and this is a fitting tribute to her legacy of promoting diversity and developing female le leaders in engineering throughout her career. Since endowing this award, Northrop Grumman is thrilled to see how its recipients have had a significant impact on business, on the profession of engineering, and on the next generation of women leaders through their ex executive leadership. And this year's awardee is no exception and is a true inspiration. I'm now honored to recognize this year's Suzanne Genesis Upward Mobility Award to Cindy Wallace Page from Black and Beach Corporation. She's receiving her award for inspirational leadership, passion, and knowledge that champion the world's water resources and for illuminating a path to success for young women engineers to follow. There's more. <laughs> okay, Northrop Grumman places a high value on strong women role models in engineering and technology. We're proud to present Cindy with this Longines Atmos clock. This clock derives energy from small temperature adjustments and atmospheric pressure changes in the environment. Each year, we present this clock as a fitting gift for the successful leader who understands the value of time and appreciates the creativity of its design. I wasn't expecting to. Uh, thank you very much for this honor. I am truly very heartfelt, overwhelmed at having this distinguished award. It means a lot to me uh, for the career that I have had, and I want to also extend my thanks to 
Black & Veatch, who I have spent all of my career with, 32 years, uh, working for a company who's committed to provide critical human infrastructure around the globe for power, water, and telecommunications, and who has allowed me to really explore my passion within the water world to make a difference around the globe, to make that critical water infrastructure available to people in all walks of life and make sure that we all have a quality of life. So I'm very committed to that and very thankful for my career. When I think about my success and I think about what has allowed me to reach to this point, which I, I hadn't envisioned, um, I, I really do believe it starts with that passion and having the passion to make a difference and then making sure that you're following that. Because there's gonna be obstacles and I can look out at all of you and I'm sure every one of us could talk about for hours the obstacles that we have had, the challenges that have been there and that have pushed us um, to make a difference and keep going. And it's when you have that passion and when you know where you're going, when you can see that destination that you know that you're gonna get around that obstacle. Whether you go around it, whether you go over it, or you just decide, I don't care, I'm going through it, you make a difference and you get there and you become that role model, all of you being that role model to help other people see that it can be done. And that gives you opportunities, opportunities that I have had that I never would have imagined because I was following my passion, because I was making a difference and doing those things. And what I also had was the opportunity to have a tremendous network because no one is successful alone. And I had tremendous support uh, both in my career in the office, but also through a tremendous partner, my husband, who always believed in me even when I didn't sometimes, and that helped you be successful. And it's understanding that you also have the opportunity to help others. That network is so tremendous to your success. Your ability to lead others, to be able to learn from others, to make a difference for others. It only takes a moment sometimes that you can change someone's life. And I had people take that moment and spend it with me. And I hope that I can continue to take those moments to spend it with others to make sure that I impact their lives and help them be successful. And finally, I think the thing that really mattered is getting beyond the fear, right? To take the risk sometimes, to lean into the discomfort that we can all have at times of not maybe feeling confident of being able to take something new on, but willing to put your hand up and say, I'm gonna do it anyway. I want this opportunity. Don't wait for it to come to you. You have to step out of your comfort zone and go get it because that's when you truly see success, feel success, and make an impact in our world. So in closing, I wanna say thank you so much for this honor and make sure that every day you lean into that discomfort, that you put your hand up and you do something different, you follow your passion, and make sure that you create the path for others to follow behind you. Thank you very much. Okay, congratulations once again, Cindy, and thank you to Northrop Grumman uh, for your endowment of this award. Now for the highlight of all SWE award award banquets, the presentation of the SWE Achievement Award. The SWE Achievement Award was created as SWE's highest honor. Since 1952, we have presented the award to a woman who has made an outstanding contribution to a field of engineering during a significant period of time. SWE Achievement Award recipients have not only had a significant and global impact on engineering, but on humanity as well. These distinguished award recipients exemplify the ability of engineers, the ability engineers have to change the world. Tonight, I'm honored to present the 2018 SWE Achievement Award to Dr. Jacqueline Chen of Sandia National Laboratories. <laughs>
Dr. Chen is re receiving this year's Achievement Award for pioneering research in computational combustion modeling, for harnessing the power of computers to advance the discipline, and for the service both to the science, to science and the scientific community. It is great, with great pride and excitement that SWE presents Dr. Chen with the 2018 Achievement Award and PIN and the Waterford Lismore Encore Crystal Bowl as part of SWE's highest award honor. This beautiful work of art is made of fine, the finest crystal and has been rendered into a striking design that features an intricate flared pattern refracting rays of light wherever it is placed. Emblazoned with a proud SWE emblem, it is a luminous masterpiece, a befitting representation of an equally luminous career. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Jacqueline Chen as SWE's 2018 Achievement Award recipient. Good evening. I'd like to thank members of the Society of Women Engineers for this awesome honor. I'm truly humbled as I look across the room and see so many talented women engineers and supporters who are contributing enormously to science and technology to make the world a better place for all of us. I have to say it's been extremely rewarding to pursue a career in computational science and engineering. While I've been driven by the science of turbulent combustion, as I reflect, most gratifying has been the opportunity to work with a diverse group of people, young and old, women and men, individuals from around the world, and scientists from vastly differing disciplines, computer science, applied mathematicians, fluid dynamicists, chemical engineers. I relished every minute of it, babysitting long computer runs well after midnight and taking conference calls, as many of you have here, at odd hours in faraway time zones to work with collaborators. Many of these colleagues, whom I've had heated debates with about our research, have wound up to be lifelong friends and collaborators. My sincere thanks to all of you. I'm also grateful to Sandia National Laboratories, operated by Honeywell NTES, where I've spent my entire professional career, and especially to the leadership early on who had the foresight to establish the Combustion Research Facility at Sandia, the CRF, CRF as it's fondly known, during the midst of the oil crisis in the Carter administration. The <clears throat> I met, uh, the CRF is a, is a Department of Energy Office of Science collaborative research facility that hosts about 100 researchers every year who work together with, with Sandia staff, postdocs, and researchers to solve important combustion problems. I was fortunate to meet a lot of my collabor collaborators through these technical exchanges at the CRF. I'd like to especially thank my nominator, Chris Shaddix from Sandia. Chris. Um, <laughs> Janet Williams from the Sandia Women's Action Committee. Janet. Our Associate Lab Director, Dory Ellis. Dory. And all of those who took the time to write letters of support for my nomination and to the selection committee for their careful deliberations. This award would not have been possible without my research team, past and present, the postdocs, collaborators, and students over the past 30-odd years. Many have gone on to have wonderful careers in academia, at national laboratories, and in, and in industry. I truly appreciate their friendship, hard work, and their share, shared joy uh, in scientific discovery. I would also like to thank my first program manager at the Department of Energy Basic Energy Sciences Gas Phase Chemical Physics Program, I know that's a mouthful, 
Bill, Bill Kirchhoff, who's now retired, who early on in the 1990s recognized the importance of high-performance computing in chemical sciences and took a chance on a young fluids researcher by providing sustained funding and encouragement to pursue fundamental in investigations into turbulence chemistry interactions through computation. I want to acknowledge that the long-term computational support that I've received from the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility, especially to Doug Cothy, Jack Wells, and Ramanan Sankaran, a past postdoc of mine, who have been long-term partners in refactoring software many, many times to keep up with and run on some of the world's largest supercomputers. I want to also acknowledge the DOE Advanced Scientific Computing Research Office for their trust in me to lead interdisciplinary teams of com computer scientists and applied mathematicians to develop combustion codes for future exascale machines that are right on the horizon. Lastly, I want to acknowledge the enduring love and support of my family, my husband Paul, who I, it took me a while to figure out what to say about him, but I would say he's had infinite patience <laughs> with me. And he's been there every step of the way as an equal partner in raising our two children, Zachary and Maya. Zachary's working for a startup in San Francisco, and Maya's a sophomore at MIT pursuing a career in engineering. Yeah. So, those who know me are, know that I'm not short for words, so I'll, I'll keep going until you guys pull the cane on me. Uh, so I'd like to share a little bit of um, thoughts on how I got into engineering. So during my formative years in Athens, Ohio in the 60s and 70s, in the Vietnam era, <coughs> era I was raised by first-generation immig immigrants from China. Both of my parents came to this country impoverished in hopes of pursuing a graduate education and establishing a better life for their future family. They believed America offered boundless opportunities for those who were willing to work hard. My father eventually became a professor in mechanical engineering at Ohio University, and my mother stayed home back in that day, all moms stayed home, and raised my sister and me in a small college town. Early in our lives, our parents <clears throat> exposed us to piano lessons, weekend Mandarin lessons taught by a handful of Chinese moms living in Athens, and they encouraged us to participate in school activities, including science fairs. My father was a soft-spoken, quiet man who took great pride in his work. Unfortunately, I wasn't gifted with his quiet demeanor, <laughs> but I think it was through watching my father construct all sorts of cam mechanisms and four-bar linkages in in the basement study for hours on end while he listened to operatic music on his turntable that I became interested uh, in engineering. As I grew up and went off to college at Ohio State University, I realized I was going to try to major in mechanical engineering, following my father's pragmatic advice that engineers were going to always be in demand. In the late 70s, there were very few women enrolled in engineering. Uh, at most, as I recall, there was only one or two other women in my, in my classes. And back then, homework problems and exams that relied on computation required uh, adeptness with manipulating slide rules or, or analog calculators for a short time until, until calculators became widely available. I was uh, very fortunate to have the mentorship of Professor Lin and his graduate students at Ohio State who invited me as an undergraduate to work part-time instrumenting a turbine blade with embedded thermocouples for a heat transfer experiment that was conducted in a subsonic wind tunnel. Watching the smoke visualization for the first time, I was amazed to see the beautiful patterns of turbulent eddies over the blade, which piqued my interest in fluid dynamics. An integral part of my undergraduate job was to learn how to machine parts needed for the experiment. And as such, I was introduced to the machine shop and its supervisor, an experienced gruff fellow, who at first welcomed me to the shop each time by handing me a broom and a dustbin, <laughs> suggesting that I sweep up 
the metal shavings off the floor. Well, I, I didn't know what to, to do or expect, so I tried to laugh it off. And I thought, well, maybe he was just a neat Nick. Um, or perhaps a little chauvinistic. And, but he learned that I was hell-bent to learn how to use that band saw to cut the plexiglass end plates for our blade. And so after a bunch of successful, unsuccessful attempts to follow the curved outline of the part that I was supposed to create, and a few sheets of melted plexiglass and a few broken blades, he realized that I was determined to make the part, so he taught me how to use the bandsaw correctly, and we became good friends after that. So after graduating from Ohio State, I joined Sandia National Laboratories, and through the Sandia sponsored, um, at that time, one year on campus graduate student fellowship for minorities and women, went on to UC Berkeley for my master's degree. There, I received excellent mentorship from Professor Boris Rubinsky, who taught me how to carefully freeze biological tissue, at that time it was cow or bovine tissue, in order to study its morphology as it thawed out. And I learned many years later after that experience that Rubinsky and his um, medical colleagues developed a cryosurgery technique based on the notion of selectively freezing tumors guided by medical imaging, ultrasound, and MRIs. I came back to Sandia after com completing my master's degree at Berkeley and worked for a couple of years performing finite element heat transfer analysis. And then a few years, few years later, I decided to go back to school once again to pursue a PhD at Stanford University under the Sandia Doctoral Study Program and became interested in computational fluid dynamics, CFD. And at that time, CFD was a relatively new tool to probe the nuances of turbulence which I had first observed in the wind tunnel. CFD blossomed in the mid-80s at the NASA Ames Research Center and the newly founded Stanford Center for Turbulence Research. And this turned out to be the, the uh, mecca back then for computational turbulence research. Although we didn't know it back then, six of us graduate students crammed into an office at NASA Ames right next door to a wind tunnel which rattled our windows uh, whenever it was operating. The rise of importance in CFD was due largely to the concurrent growth in high-performance computing and the development of high-fidelity computational tools like direct numerical simulation and large eddy simulation, which required all of the horsepower of even those relatively early supercomputers, the Krays um, that were large and had to be cooled with, uh, with uh, floor inert, in these waterfall kinds of configurations, which were way less powerful than the processors that we use in our laptops today. So I'd like to say just a few remarks about computational turbulent combustion and its symbiotic relationship with, uh, with high-performance computing. As we know, turbulence is ubiquitous. It's all around us. It's present in nature. Uh, for example, uh, flying in here to Minneapolis, I noted the bumpiness as we were trying to land the plane. That's turbulence. It's also partly responsible for the spread of wildfires and tornadoes that, uh, and the devastation that it produces. But if understood and tamed, turbulence, and in particular turbulent combustion, it can be engineered to provide more fuel efficient engines that would be, uh, more fuel efficient engines that would, then would be possible uh, by slower and less violent mixing. These are the engines that um, we take for granted in our modern societies that we rely on every day for providing electricity in our homes and offices and for transporting people and goods. So turbulent processes, including combustion, are, are a little bit hard to understand and to control because there's an extremely large range of scales, both in space and time, uh, from where the biggest eddies uh, that are the size of the device down to the smallest eddies where energy and heat are dissipated at molecular scales. And also, it's hard to understand because of the nonlinearities associated with multi-physics, for example, chemistry, and its interaction with turbulent mixing. For example, in combustion, um, typically it takes thousands of species and reactions to predict the behavior of a gasoline or diesel fuel. Owing to its multi-scale, multi-physics nature, um, first principles Simulations of these turbulent processes, including combustion, need a huge amount of computing, computing power. 
And over several decades, um, we uh, computational CFD and has been able to keep pace pretty much with Moore's Law, which has led to um, exponential growth in computing. So for example, over a period of about 40 years since I started in this um, area, computing power has gone up by eight orders of magnitude. This has enabled much greater fidelity in the physical representations of turbulence and chemistry. Um, when I, for example, when I started at Ames in the 80s, it was possible then to only directly simulate quasi-laminar or weak turbulence, and chemistry was represented by only a single reaction step. While advances in computing um, at the petascale today, that's 10 to the 15 floating point operations per second, it's now feasible to resolve a much broader range of turbulence scales and represent flames with well over 100 species, and hence start to approach device-relevant parameter regimes. It's also recently become feasible and it's, uh, to compose more complicated computational workflows that incorporate in situ an an analysis and machine learning to detect, for example, anomalous physical events, looking for the needle in the haystack. So that, so, for example, incipient autoignition in my field, which could then be used to steer um, either local adaptive computational mesh refinement or changes in, in fuel injection and so on to affect the combustion efficiency and emissions. Early on, I realized that to use these complicated HPC systems that I was not going to be able to re rewrite my code by myself as the systems were becoming more and more complex. I knew that I had to either collaborate or die. It was necessary uh, to collaborate with multidisciplinary teams of computer scientists, applied mathematicians, and computational scientists and engineers. To flourish required not only access to increasingly more capable hardware, but also deep physical sciences domain knowledge and computationally efficient software all the way from the application software on down to the operating system, and all of that had to work seamlessly together tailored to the underlying hardware constraints. So in other words, critical mass of the right folks was, was needed, focusing on a common target challenge problem for a, a sustained period of time. So I've had the good fortune to lead several interdisciplinary teams of researchers with diverse expertise and this presents, of course, both challenges as well as rewards. As, as we all know, each community's culture and technical jargon is different. And in addition to having a common technical goal, I found that honest communication, building trust, and sometimes having the occasional beer outside of work <laughs> is vital to working effectively together. You have to be able to work outside of your comfort zone, I think previous um, awardee said the same thing, and venture into somebody else's sandbox and way of looking at things. So as a fluid dynamicist, it's interesting to see just how different I view the world from how a computer scientist views the world. This dichotomy is embodied, for example, in the software that we each write to accomplish the same task. I write software known as stencil code to solve large systems of partial differential equations in a programming language, a very old one, Fortran, with nested loops that emulate the underlying governing physical laws and Navier Stokes equations. So, for all you CFDers out there. On the other hand, my computer science colleague will write the same stencil code, but he will count all the floating point operations and try to minimize the working set size for a given machine architecture, resulting code that is totally undecipherable by a fluid dynamicist. <laughs> so these underlying, uh, underlying differences in our culture are simultaneously the source of great frustration at times, but they're also the fountain of new ideas that push computational technology forward. For example, by developing new programming abstractions at multiple layers, that render a code more readable by an engineer, while also making the code run screaming fast by minimizing operations and data motion in and out of a machine's memory registers, results in a code that's far more computationally efficient, enabling 
larger and more complex simulations to be performed. So it's a win-win outcome. So I'd like to leave you with a few parting thoughts. The quality of our lives and those of future generations and also the health of our planet will, be, will depend on the technology that all of you will develop. I think the future is bright and it's filled with potential well beyond the latest engineering feats. Autonomous vehicles, robotic pro prostheses that enable wounded veterans to walk again, And perhaps unimaginable advances at the intersection between medicine, engineering, and computational sciences. Success in your endeavors will depend, of course, on staying the course when the course is harder than you expect, taking advantage of each other's complementary expertise and diverse viewpoints, not being afraid, uh, be opportunistic, and most importantly, bring along future generations of engineers. So thanks a lot for listening, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, and congratulations again, Dr. Chen. Your remarkable contributions to engineering will inspire each of us to strive to be leaders in our respective fields. Congratulations. Thank you once again to our awards and recognition program volunteers for their careful consideration and selection of tonight's outstanding awards recipients. And congratulations to everyone honored here this evening. I would also like to once again thank Global Foundries for their sponsorship of tonight's reception, and to Northrop Grumman and Boston Scientific for their dinner and program. Congratulations once again to tonight's amazing award recipients. These women and men have certainly broken some boundaries in order to create a better world. You are an inspiration for everyone here tonight. And we look forward to seeing you all at the post-awards after party across the street at the Hilton Minneapolis in the Symphony Ballrooms. Mingle with our award recipients over desserts and beverages. All are invited. So thank you again and good night.